Well, Dave Aranda has already taken the blame for the problems that Baylor football has had on the field. Now he's taking the blame for the failures of Baylor football that are happening off the field. This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked on Baylor brought to you today by Prize Picks. And thank you also for making it your first listen today and every day. You know, it's not always easy putting out strictly Baylor content five days a week. The only one to do that that's not a part of Baylor University. But darn it, I'm happy to do it. Happy to do it for you guys. Can I just, before we get into this today, it's Thanksgiving week. I want to be thankful about things. Appreciative. And I'm really thankful for you guys, the fans, that have followed on and locked on Baylor. It's been a it's been an awesome two months here. Um, it's not over. I know I don't want it to sound like that, um, but it's just been great the interaction that you guys have had, both on on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, um, as well. Getting in the comments section, uh, honestly, there are people who think I have burner YouTube accounts because of uh, how active that comment section can get and and how much you guys like the content. So. I, I don't have any YouTube burner accounts. Um, it might not be used for the comment section of my own channel, but I appreciate you guys nonetheless. So that's why I love dropping in those questions to get you guys to comment. It, it helps a lot with YouTube's algorithm. So really appreciate that and appreciate you guys. So thank you for getting involved. Talking today about two of our favorite subjects, Dave Aranda, head coach of the Baylor Bears, and name, image, and likeness. Something that Baylor has struggled with and I don't think it's any coincidence that since the rise of the NIL and the real rise of the transfer portal after the 2021 season, which Baylor had its most successful season ever, it's been pretty downhill ever since. Six and seven uh, with four straight losses to end 2022, and then a very real chance after this weekend to say the Baylor Bears finish the season three and nine. So where has it gone wrong? And it seems so easy, and this is what I was doing at first, because honestly, I don't have a great grip of NIL and what schools can do with it. So that's why I haven't been slamming Baylor on it or naming names or anything like that. I don't have a terrific grip on it, but I think I'm knowing enough now to know that Baylor shouldn't be this far behind because when, when you first heard about NIL and it was natural, these were the first teams that, that really um, benefited from it. The big state schools, the big football programs, even ones that haven't been successful in a long time. Nebraska is one of the most successful NIL programs, Nebraska football, in, in the entire country uh, because they can do these huge collectives. They have a humongous alumni base. Uh, it's the only show in town in a case like Nebraska. But we also see uh, the big impact it has at Texas and A&M and, and you know, Florida and Michigan, of course, right? That's That's natural. But the more we get into this NIL sphere, the more I think Baylor doesn't have an excuse to be this far behind. You know, they're never going to be what UT and what AM and Alabama and Nebraska and USC are, or Notre Dame is in the NIL world. But this shouldn't be just the easy, low hanging fruit of why can't Baylor compete with the big boys? the way they haven't the last two years. That's that's a little too easy an excuse for me, and I don't, I don't think it really works. Because, A, we do see it at some other schools that are comparable to Baylor because they put together collectives. Um, the one that springs to mind right away is the darling of this year's college football season, James Madison. It was being railroaded out of a bowl game. They finally lost. They're, what, 9-1, um, in their second year of Division One, that's a school that's pretty comparable to Baylor. Um, and they have been able to put collectives up. Now, when they made the switch to FBS football, they had to cut some sports. Uh, but that has worked out tremendously for them. And then I think of places like Ole Miss and Oregon State, which on the Dome, you're like, well, Cameron, those are state schools. And they're much bigger than Baylor because they're state schools, but they're not. Oregon State and Ole Miss are roughly the same size. In fact, in terms of overall student, Baylor has more students than Ole Miss. And those are two teams that uh, before this weekend were in the top 15 
in football this year. And Ole Miss, obviously the one that stands out because that's the team that Baylor played in the Sugar Bowl two years ago. So why is Baylor falling too far behind? Well, Dave Aranda said, you know, didn't give an excuse or excuse as to why they've fallen behind, but says, that's on me. That's on me. And so when he was asked in his press conference, as I'm recording this today, it was Monday's press conference, you know, what needs to change? How often do you and Mac Rhodes talk about this NIL sphere and, and what needs to change going forward? What does that mean for your program? He gave this about two minute answer. You mentioned the, the NIL thing. How often do you and Mac talk about that and, and, and how to build that up? A lot. Yeah. I think the, I think the main, probably one of the main problems with all that is just, has probably been me. You know, I think the, um, um, you know, one of the things that's always that's always been a struggle is, and I think you know for here, it's the way to balance it is the um, the labeling and the judgment that comes when um, you know you're in a transactional thing when um, you know. If you're labeled this, I treat you like that. If you're labeled this, I treat you a different way. So much of college football is that, and I've tried very hard not to be that and have really very much wanted to be that way and to win. And, uh, you know, this, this year has been a struggle to do that. And so um, when you get into the NIL space and you need to, uh, more so than what we've been, then you open the door to that, of uh, just whether it's staff or just anyone in general, saying, hey, this is a so-and-so percentage guy or a allocation guy. This is a another allocation guy or, you know, this is that amount, this is that amount. And I think in all of that, you don't want to treat them that way, you know. You want to be able to treat them um, um, in a, at a much higher, uh, much higher level than any form of payment or money or anything like that. And I just don't think that happens, to be honest. I think it's all accepted that this is a business and you go. And so to be in it but not be of it is the is going to be the challenge. And for me personally, I look at that as just growth and and, um, and for the, the staff and all of it. And so I think, um, yeah, we talk about it quite a bit. And so I'm excited about kind of what we're pushing towards. I think it's very important. You know, now, you know, the what we're doing is important, but how we do it is probably more important. So he's being honest there, which we love. We always love Dave's honesty, and it's been honesty to a fault. Two things about this one. First thing, it's been something that's been clamored about by the fans for two years now, and that's not a reason why you fire a coach or anything like that, but when you know your job is hanging by a thread and that the only thing that might be saving you is the price of your buyout, I might just stay away from talking about NIL. And this was actually the second NIL question he got. So he kind of offered this up during the during the press conference. This was a follow-up question by Bryce Cherry. Uh, we're going to play the first answer that kind of goes into two separate categories in the next segment. But why even talk about it? Don't talk about it. Don't incriminate yourself. You know, this is like if a guy's girlfriend is found murdered and he says, oh yeah, so... I don't have an alibi and, you know, we've been fighting a lot lately with financial issues. She's got a life insurance policy on her. Just don't offer it up. Don't say anything. Even in the, in the goodness of your heart, Dave, saying, being honest, you know, a lot of that's on me. Don't say that. Let's just, let's just stay away from that. You know, it's something we're working on and Mac Rhodes has been the one talking about it all season. And he's been talking about how, how well it's gone and things that you might not see on the field yet or might not see. Um, until next year and this, that, and the other. And there's something to be said about that. The second point that I got out of this answer is, what the hell is he talking about? What is he talking about? I know what these words mean individually, but what was that answer? Does anyone, please, please, if you know what he's talking about, please get in the comment section and tell me. I've got nothing, and I've heard Dave Aranda more than most people on the face of the earth, and I can't decipher this one. I think there's a part in there where he's talking about, you know, he doesn't basically doesn't want to pay some players more than others. 
And that's the blanket argument against NIL and paying athletes in general in college. But that's the name of the game. And I can guarantee you guys are being, Michael Penix is being paid a lot more than probably all of his teammates at Washington. And, you know, how much is Brock Bowers getting paid versus the rest of his teammates at Georgia? Or, you know, I'm sure there are pay scales at Alabama and at the University of Texas and Ohio State, and Blake Corum is making a lot more money than everyone else has at Michigan. What are the common threads with those teams? It doesn't stop them. They're some of the best teams in the country. That doesn't, it, it can work. It can work. And so I think that's a, it's kind of a hollow excuse for someone like Dabo Sweeney at Clemson. And now what it looks like we're set up for here at Baylor as the NIL sphere goes into its you know third season next year and will likely have Dave Aranda still as the head coach. I don't like building in those excuses. But other than that part of the cancer, I have no freaking clue what he's talking about. I wish I did. I wish I did, but I don't know. I don't know. And there's another thing he said about what they need to work on in the offseason and how that could really derail this team going forward. We're going to talk about that in just a second here. But first, I got to tell you about LinkedIn Talent Solutions. Look, I mean, it's it's not easy when you're running a small business. Every move you make could be the end-all, be-all of what you're doing out there. It's stressful. It's stressful, especially doing things like hiring. And that's why LinkedIn Talent Solutions takes the stress out of it. You want to be 100% certain that you have the access to the best qualified candidates, and that's where LinkedIn Job steps in. You are going to add your job to the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. That's a good first start. Simple tools like screening questions, which not every company does, uh, will make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. <laughs> They help you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to. And they do it faster than anybody else. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for the nice pricely sum of free terms and conditions to apply. So NIL isn't the only thing that Dave Aranda has to worry about any day, but especially going into this off season. The other thing, which kind of goes hand in hand with that in today's college football atmosphere, is the transfer portal. And that is something that Dave was on early. And what I mean by on early was on the blame bus early. He said, yeah, I didn't handle that very well. He was saying that last spring, basically, last exit interview uh, for last season. He said, I didn't, I didn't treat this as well as I should have and thought he had made the changes this year with the Barrington brothers and Keytron Jackson and... Um, Isaiah Dunson and uh, who was he? Somebody, Mike Smith was one of the big ones before he got hurt this year. Um, and it still hasn't panned out. Barrington brothers have anger, anchored a bad offensive line. Um, unfortunately for Mike Smith, he was out by what the end of September, that UCF game, the big comeback. Um, Keytron Jackson hasn't been put in a great position to succeed, um, but hasn't had a banner season either. Dominic Richardson just got his first touchdown of the season on Saturday. So hasn't really worked out this year either. Quantity was there. Quality was not. And so Dave was once again, very candid when said, Hey, what's the first thing that y'all will need to look at, or maybe for a better word is worry about when going in to next season as the season is basically going to end on Saturday. Let's see. So one would be be more aggressive, and this would be a, a, um, a me thing before anything else, but being more aggressive just with NIL. And, um, you know, I think the way it stands right now just with our record and with the amount of freshmen that are playing on our team and uh, for the, for, you know, depending, there's various ranges in there from – you know, some um, some play to a lot of play to 
you know, some really impressive play by freshmen. Uh, we are kind of the, the perfect, uh, perfect uh, example of a team to be poached. You know, and so all of that's in play right now, and is happening right now, and is a, a is a, is something that I'm spending a lot of time on. And so you know, whether that's nil for the guys that are on our team, and getting that to where that um, is uh, way competitive, and then you know, for guys that are coming in and um, that are going to be on our team, and and all that, I think I think it's a um, it's something that um, is a major focus. And then, you know, the development piece. I think there's – you could argue that college football is no longer – there's no such thing as development, that it's plug and play, you know. And, you know, our season could be looked at as an example of that. And so, you know, there there were a bunch of guys that have played, and so we, we want to be able to keep them all here, and then we want to be able to develop them in the off season. we got guys that need to gain weight. We've got guys that um, that need to hone on this skill or that. Um, and then we've got a fair amount of people, seniors that are leaving, so we've got some some spots to fill. And so the recruiting piece is going to be a major one and to be as aggressive as we can in that area. So he makes good points there. The silver lining is not the silver lining. The silver lining this year isn't what it would be in past years because the silver lining of this team is it's young. You've got a lot of guys who got a lot of experience this year. So two, three years down the line, or even next year, that should pay some dividends for Baylor, but not in the transfer portal era. And I'm glad Dave at least realizes that, that that might not be a good thing at all, because I think the word he used in there is poachable. They're a very poachable team, uh, even with a three and nine record. Uh, and he's right. There have been some young guys that um, are very poachable for Power 5 programs. And I think both NIL and the transfer portal and lack thereof has been a big reason why the numbers have gone down in recruiting. In fact, right now, Baylor is at 61st in the nation uh, for 2024, which if they stick around there or anywhere near there, it will be the worst the worst thing that Baylor has had in a recruiting class since 2007. The last year of Guy Morris, they were 67th. First year of Art, they were 56th and 50th, and then have been in the top 40 ever since. Uh, 2020, they weren't very good, 51. But they're a solid top 40 team, or at least they should be, and they're not there. So what I decided to do is look at five guys who could well be in the transfer portal in just a week here. And I had to take Caden Jenkins off. He was the obvious number one pick. But he recommitted basically on Saturday before the game saying, hey, I want to stay here at Baylor. And that's awesome because Caden, as I've said on this before, he is a foundational defensive player. And he has shown some awesome bright flashes this season. I think he could be a stellar defensive back for this team in the future. So that's great. And the other great part of it is, too, that there are so many young guys in the defensive backfield. Um, Hopefully he is something of a leader to them and he is convincing them or they're following suit saying, Hey, we are going to, to stay here and have those dividends pay off. So in the top five guys, I didn't have any freshman defensive backs, but we do start with a couple D backs. Number five, Alfonso Allen. Remember him? The safety who played a little bit of star last year, who I thought had some good games early on in his freshman season back in 2022, but hasn't seen a lot of the field so far in 2023. Now, he's one of those Miami Central guys, one of the top high school programs in the nation, uh, four-star out of high school, and chose Baylor over, you might have heard of these schools, Alabama, Clemson, Florida, Florida State, Oklahoma, USC, and Texas A&M. Not to say those coaches are going to be knocking on his door, but he's going to have some options. He's going to have some options. So Alfonso Allen, does he stick around? Another one at the safety position, Devin Bobby. I thought has shown some really good flashes this year. Had some nice plays actually uh, in, against TCU. I haven't watched the film back to see what he did when he wasn't in and around the ball, but uh, they obviously did not have a good game against the pass. He's another four star. So, and a sophomore like Alfonso Allen. So he's got time left. Number three is a guy who hasn't seen the field a lot. Armani Winfield. Remember him? Louisville, four star. Wide receiver, picked Baylor 
over Alabama, Texas, Michigan, and Florida. And those were, like Alfonso Allen, legit. Like, not just, hey, they, they got a phone call from Nick Saban and that was it. No, no, no. Like, Alabama and Texas were hats on the table for him. And he picked Baylor. And so far in his career, eight career receptions, 100 yards. And I think my man is frustrated because he retweeted a tweet on Sunday um, from Grayson Grunhafer, recruiting expert, uh, covering Baylor for uh, Sikkim, Sikkim 365, and said that the tweet said that Armani Winfield is a top 10 recruit in Baylor history. And that, and if you remember, it was a big deal. Like, oh man, this guy legitimately picked Baylor over Alabama. So I think Armani might have retweeted that at a specific time to just remind everyone um, how big a prospect he was out of high school and a guy who had a couple of catches in his first ever game. We've barely seen him since. Again, just eight career receptions. So probably could be out the door. Another guy who we saw a lot of as a true freshman last year. Yeah, Richard Reese. Where does he go? He has been unheard of uh, for most of this year. This past game against TCU was the first game in his college career. He did not get a single carry. And from what I saw, he was out there for the first snap offensively, which is a pass. And he did not appear on the field again for Baylor. And this comes uh, uh, less than a month after Dave Aranda said he is still a focal point of our offense. And this has been a curious case to where you have to start wondering, was he just the right guy at the right time last year, where again, running back was uncertain with Tay McWilliams and Quaylen Jones and Jordan Jenkins, who still doesn't get any touches this year. Um, Richard Reese was kind of the guy at the right time. When Tay McWilliams goes down, they're like, okay, we got to try out some other guys. And Richard Reese had some great games. And I think with the options they had this year, they thought, well, Dominic Richardson is a better option. And then Dawson Pendergrass was a better option. Even when they haven't run the football well as a team, those guys get a lot more touches than Richard Reese does. I think he will put on tape a 970-yard season as a true freshman, and that will certainly get him some interest from Power 5 schools. Absolutely. And number one is a guy, by the way, that's another sophomore. Number one is a guy who doesn't fit that age build, and that is Drake Dabney. Drake Dabney, the senior, um, has been awesome this year. Actually, been one of the one of the few bright spots on this team, and he has been lighting it up over the last couple games. He's shown some great hands, awesome athleticism, and has always been a good blocker. He looks like an NFL tight end. So I think Drake Dabney, when he sees a lot of the other tight ends that are invited to the Senior Bowl and the All American game and all that. He's going to say, you know, I should be there too. And I think he f he would probably feel, and based off the product on the field, you absolutely cannot disagree with him, that he would be better served in a different kind of offense somewhere else um, that has a better chance of winning. So can't blame him there uh, and improve his NFL draft stock. So those are the five. Alfonso Allen, Devin Bobby, Armani Winfield, Richard Reese, Drake Dabney, all skill position players. Uh, to watch out for. And it will be quite interesting to see what their decision process is like, if Dave Aranda is going to be the head coach, how they're going to keep him there, and what 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 the promises are going to be to these guys and others who um, are certainly getting interest on what would be the benefits uh, for them staying at Baylor for another year under Dave Aranda. Today's episode is also brought to you by Prize Picks. It's the number one daily fantasy sports platform in all of North America. It's my favorite to play too because it's super easy. And now you've got all these sports going on with college basketball, college football, NFL, NBA, NHL, college hockey. All right, you guys might not follow that as much. But with that, you can go all over the place, including combining some of those picks. So the combo projections across football and basketball are one of the things that really separates prize picks from a lot of others. So uh, for example, you could pick Dak Prescott and uh, Jason Tatum for 10 and a half uh, three pointers made and touchdowns combined. 
probably be like eight and a half, but that's an awesome pick. And you can, you know, stay intact or in touch with your two sports, two games going on, and you can make some easy money off it. And you can play alongside some of the prize picks, favorite players like Meek Mill. He loves playing it. Uh, you can find them under community plays in the promos tab to view what their picks are for each week. And the best part, I always say the best part about prize picks is that reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if, one of your players gets injured. So for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So I know I've convinced you. What you got to do, go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college and then use the code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash locked on college plus the, plus the promo code. Locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Last part of today's show is getting away from the doom and gloom a little bit and talking about something I missed this season. Not just winning football games, not just that, but my new favorite tradition that we had the two years before that, and that is Baylor playing BYU. Okay, my favorite game is Baylor TCU because I hate them and I want to beat them so bad. But as you can probably tell, we never freaking beat them. We are one and one in two classic games against BYU. And you can't find anyone that has said a bad word about their experiences at these games with the two fan bases. And they just seem to love each other. It seems like a perfect match. This Baylor and BYU, the two. The two schools get carrying the torch for major Christian college football programs that aren't named Notre Dame or Boston College, but I wouldn't call them a major college football program. Uh, I went to the game at Provo last year. It was awesome. It's one of the best atmospheres in college football when that place is rocking. It's probably the best view in college football, and I know you've heard this before, but they're so nice. They're the most gracious hosts. And if you didn't go to that game at BYU, you probably at least saw what it was like in that stadium. I mean, the place was packed. I was there three hours before game time. All the student seats were filled. They were camping out for it. They are so excited to have a team like Baylor um, out there and playing them. Of course, we were a top 10 team at, team at the time, um, but it was such a great take. And the year before, I mean, they took over half of McLean Stadium, they being the BYU fans. Uh, because they're everywhere, and they're so great, and they're so into their football. That's another thing, too, is for a BYU program, which is right on the doorstep of a Blue Blood college football program. I mean, look, they've had decades of success. Um, they've had a Heisman Trophy winner. They have a national championship. They have guys in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Super Bowl champion quarterbacks, all that great stuff. You know, they're not at the level of Ohio State or Michigan, but they're certainly a major brand in college football. and. What's great about those is so often when you see the major brands or the Blue Bloods, the fans are just so insufferable. Case in point, the University of Texas, Texas Agricultural and Mechanical, Florida, Nebraska, Notre Dame. Annoying, delusional, out of touch, not BYU. No siree. They are knowledgeable football fans who... uh don't ever take themselves too seriously and very rarely will they annoy you on a message board. Rarely, if ever. And on the Baylor side, A, that's refreshing, right? Because we're used to dealing with UT and AM fans and OU fans and sometimes even TCU fans fall into that category. And it's nice to have sort of a rivalry that isn't so vitriolic. So, on um, Baylor's standpoint, if we want to be this very nice and albeit kind of lame school, let's at least have a team like BYU on there so we won't get told how lame we are that particular week. Uh, they're awesome fans. It's an awesome setting, um, and they are just so appreciative of good college football and the good fans of college football. And I think that's why this has been a match made in heaven. There are two football programs that, at least in, in this century, I should say in the last decade, are, are very similar um, they've had their ups and downs. They've had some very good ups. Um, Baylor being 
the, the better of those two ups. Um, they've had some great um, figureheads at quarterback. Zach Wilson, number two pick in the draft two years ago for BYU. Obviously, RG3 winning the Heisman Trophy. Um, Kalani Sataki's done a, done a great job there. Uh, Bronco Mendenhall before that. Obviously, Baylor's had Art Bryles and Matt Rule. and Yeah, let's just stick with those coaches. Um, and so this has been two programs that mirror each other really well. And I think Baylor is a good secondary rival for BYU because we're not the the toxicity that comes with the, with the Utah Utes of being in in the state trying to just crap on you guys wherever you, you can because you're a Christian school we're, we're not like that <laughs> it's a friendly rivalry that can be very competitive and I think these two schools go in similar waves so in a lot of ways it's like the Baylor TCU rivalry which I do think is the best in the Big 12 but it's without all the nastiness and vitriol and just pure a holery that TCU fans give you, especially when you're at the game. It's a nice, friendly competition. And maybe I'm just drinking the Kool-Aid because I went there and they were awesome to me. But that is a, a great college football program, great college football atmosphere. And they want to play Baylor. They don't care about TCU. They don't care about Oklahoma State. They don't care about Texas Tech. They care about Utah. They care about playing Utah and playing Baylor. They've loved that experience. So why are we dropping the ball on that? Baylor, BYU, it makes too much darn sense. With this one, unlike the Baylor-TCU rivalry, lean into it, man. Lean into the Christianity aspect. Get a trophy that's an altar or something. That'd be great. Let's do it. This should be, I know you can't use this term, but the holy war. This should be it. You know? These two teams want it. They're very similar programs. They're fan bases that actually like each other, but they know they're good measuring sticks on the other side. That was when I was so excited about to see on the 2021 schedule um, to have them coming to Waco for homecoming. And it was a brilliant atmosphere. And then a great atmosphere the next year, including a good amount of Baylor fans there. I was a little surprised at how many Baylor fans were there. But a great atmosphere in Provo in 2022. What are we doing here, guys? Big 12. Brett. What are we doing here? This has got to be a protected one. Play these two every year. It's too good to miss. It's too good for PR. It, it's not going to get nasty. Um, it just makes too much sense for me. Let me know what you think down in the comments. Baylor, BYU. Where are my BYU fans at? Where are you guys? I know you you show up on YouTube and in the football stadium. What do you guys think? Do you Am I overplaying this? Do you think that this should be a protected rivalry? Do you want to play Baylor every year like it sounds like it, it like it does and what your fans were telling me in Provo? Anyway, I also love their uniforms. And they're really nice. And the Cougar guy is an awesome mascot because he's got moves and, you know, runs through rings of fire and stuff. Baylor, BYU, bring it in. Call it the Crusade. I don't care. Uh, it's going to be an awesome, awesome matchup for years to come. I just hope it's one of those ones that go year in, year out. Anyway, thank you for joining Locked on Baylor once again. Thank you for making it your first listen today and every day. Let me know down in the comments, who do you think might enter the transfer portal this year? What does Baylor need to do to get better at NIL? And should Baylor be playing BYU every year? I think yes. I think they're one of the great fan bases in college football, and I don't want to miss out on that opportunity while they're here in our conference. That was one of the big coups. The first one, the first big coup that we got to the Big 12 were those guys of the original four that we expanded with, with UCF, Cincinnati, Houston, and BYU. Houston made the most sense, but BYU is the biggest fish in that pond. So bring them on. Let's play every year. Let's do it. We'll be back tomorrow talking more basketball as we look ahead to Wednesday when the Bears will be back on the court playing Oregon State up in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, that's in New York. Um, and we'll talk some more then. So thank you for tuning in. Once again, and for making your first listen today and every day, Locked on Baylor.